Hi everyone, I'm Cathy Graham. I'm Director of Music at the British Council, for those of you who don't know me. I'm really happy to be speaking to you and I'm really happy that the British Council is part of the Talent Development Conference with PRS Foundation. The PRS Foundation is an incredibly important partner for us and the area we're looking at is very important to the sector. So I want to welcome all the UK delegates to today's session and to extend a special warm welcome to the panelists who have come to us from Morocco, Uganda, China and Myanmar, which is uh, the wonders of digital. What I want to do now is to introduce you to the British Council and the music department's place within it. The British Council is the UK's cultural relations organisation and its main aim is to build trust, friendship and understanding between the UK and the rest of the world. And we aim to create opportunities for everybody, for the people of the UK and for the people of the countries we work with. We're non-governmental, although we're funded. Uh, government funds are a small part of turnover or were pre-COVID, and I'll come back to that in a minute. We work long-term, we work people to people, not government to government, and that's incredibly important because it means that we can work and keep a contact with people around the world when our governments are not able to. A really good example of how that can work is the UK Russia Year of Music that we managed to pull off last year in spite of colossal political tensions and actually the closure of the British Council in Russia and that was following the Skripal poisoning in Salisbury which I'm sure you will remember. We actually ended up with a fantastic range of projects bringing together Russian and UK artists and music industry professionals and we built some real friendships and relationships with the results still pouring in and still developing. Uh, and for those of you who like stats, we worked with 577 UK artists, 96 UK organisations and held 235 events in 34 cities across the whole of Russia, including Siberia, which I visited for the first time. And that was really amazing. Uh, and we worked with even more Russian artists and Russian organisations. Our overall reach was over 48 million during the year. Um, I'd just like to tell you a couple of things that you may not know about the British Council, which I think are quite relevant at the moment. A lot of our grant funded work is working with developing countries, so-called ODA, Official Development Assistance. Uh, and that is particularly true of Arts Group, the Arts Department. Uh, we use quite a bit of a government grant. Now, before COVID, uh, Government grant was really about 14% of turnover, that's 1-4%, which I think is quite a surprise to a lot of people. Everything else is um, earned income. Last March, virtually all of our income generating work dried up and we were in quite a serious financial position and we have managed through a government loan, which we're still receiving. We know we're going to get support via a grant going forward, so they're not the details. Um, so we have faced some real challenges, but we're still working and we are um, increasing the work we're able to do. And I'm hoping that that will increase even more before much longer. Just a little bit about music team. So in music team, we deliver the British Council's aims through creating opportunities for music sectors the UK sector and the sectors in the countries that we work with overseas. We work with all genres from classical to hip hop, everything in between. And we work with all parts of the sector. So from artists to organizations and all kinds of sector professionals. We work in partnership uh, and we have a team which is small but per perfectly formed. And we're all from the coalface. We've all worked in the industry um, uh, and between us, we have a fantastic amount of knowledge and experience, and it's all complementary. Um, and it's great fun working together because we learn from each other on a daily basis. Each of the music program managers, and we have five, have a couple of regions of the world as their brief where they specialize and, and uh, a first point of contact for. And the way we work is that we respond to the needs of the countries overseas, working with our colleagues there, uh, and our colleagues are almost exclusively local staff with a, a really good knowledge of their sectors. 
um, and we work to the British Council strategy, but at the same time, we work to address the needs of the UK sector. And we work always to reach that sweet spot where everybody's needs and wishes are being fulfilled. So what I thought I'd do now is illustrate the work we do a little bit by talking about some of the international opportunities that we create uh, and some of the projects that we are running. Uh, we create these opportunities through all kinds of activities. Uh, they may be performances or industry seminars and panels. We have an inbound showcasing program where we bring overseas promoters, venue promoters, festival promoters from all around the world to see UK work. And that can be at the Great Escape, the Huddersfield Contemporary Music Festival. Last year, we brought uh, delegates over to Cryptic Sonica. Um, we also work with collaborations, facilitating collaborations, study visits, and generally connecting people. So we're not an export organisation, but we do support export, albeit indirectly, most of the time. We also work particularly in areas where the UK is perceived as taking the lead. Uh, just a few examples. Music and disability. Uh, a lot of the world looks to us for examples of good practice. We worked recently with Attitude is Everything to translate their DIY access guides into over 12 languages around the world. And we worked with organizations to open new conversations about deaf and disabled access to live music. We also worked last year with the Bristol Music Trust convening a group of music and disability organizations in the Southwest to share their experience with a delegation of visitors from performing arts venues from Hong Kong. And we're currently working with Drake Music in Japan. Uh, we've worked with music and musicians in arts and aging, for example, Manchester Camerata in China. And we do a lot of work uh, with women in music. Uh, at the moment, we're partnering with organizations in Pakistan and Tunisia offering 12 month memberships to Saffron Members Club for emerging female electronic music composers and producers. Just a few examples of our work in artist development, again, to give you a flavor of the kind of things we do. And I have to say that my favorite program has to be uh, the one that we created together with PRS Foundation and that's Musicians in Residence. This program, it gives musicians again from all genres, a deep dive into different cultures. And this started and was for many years enabling musicians to travel to different countries. China, Brazil, UAE and Russia have been the four that we've worked in so far. We've allowed them to stay for four to six weeks, um, hosted by a local partner to meet the local music scene and just get to know artists, the way things work, and just to be there and to imbibe the culture. And we've had musicians as diverse as Imogen Heap, Jasmine Kent Rochman, Surati Korwa, Love Sega, Emmy the Great, and so on. And that has produced some really amazing results uh, without putting pressure on musicians to produce something. I think almost everybody has felt that their practice has been informed by what they've learned. Um, and we've seen several artists winning awards for work that they've created on their return. Our colleagues at the Britain Peers, uh, Britain Peers Arts hosted a Russian musician as part of the UK Russia residency programme in the Year of Music. That was last summer. And that was probably the first time that we had um, moved into hosting overseas artists in the UK, as well as sending UK artists over to countries overseas. Uh, it depends a lot on having really good partners to host these musicians. And um, we certainly got one with Britain Peers Art. As I said, this program was originally face-to-face. -face. Uh, now of necessity, we're experimenting with digital and we have Midori traveling to Brazil in March and we'll be watching carefully and learning from the experience because I think we're going to be doing much more digital work in the future. Another artist development program we worked on was with Brighter Sound in Spain last year, supporting career development for emerging artists and professionals from a wide range of backgrounds. So finally, I just wanted to say a few words around the challenges that we're all facing at the moment um, and the planet uh, and our world is facing an incredible time uh, that we've all got to see through together. 
We've got Black Lives Matter, Brexit, COVID-19, and the climate emergency, which is phenomenal. The events in the US last May have really given an impetus to the imperative for all of us to create a much more diverse sector and to address issues of equality of opportunity. And I know that we're all working very hard, both internally and with our external partners and the programmes we run to, to make real a, a real step change in this area. One of the British Council music team's responses to this is doing some initial work with colleagues in Sub-Saharan Africa, South America, the US and the UK, preparing for a major program which aims to raise the profile of and improve career paths for emerging African and African diaspora artists. Um, and it'll involve contributing to creating uh, a more equitable music industry globally. We want to establish global platforms and facilitate ways into the industry for African and African diaspora musicians, digital content creators and music producers. So the, the whole of the industry. And we'll work through training, collaboration and networking and many other things. This is right at the start and we haven't gone public with it. So it's just a heads up for those of you here today. We have a lot of work to do and we have a lot of fundraising to do before we can make that incredibly ambitious dream a reality. Regarding Brexit, uh, we're just at the moment following the issues around work permits for musicians and industry professionals touring to Europe. Um, I've been at a session today, along with Joe Franklin, in fact, just looking at these issues with uh, UK music. Also looking at the issues of haulage and cabotage, VAT and social security and data adequacy, words that I never thought I would take into my mouth, but of course they're incredibly important at the moment. Uh, we recently held a barrister-led webinar on visa routes for artists coming into the UK, and we're looking to see how we can contribute to helping the sector face the new issues actually um, going out of the UK into Europe. Regarding COVID, uh, like everybody else, we've pivoted. And that's a word which I'm really going to dislike because I think we've probably finished pivoting now and digital is a truly integral way of our working, which is here to stay. Right at the start of lockdown, we held industry roundtables uh, from every bit of the sector. We wanted to listen to how the sector was coping, to hear the views on international work going forwards, on how development of digital work was happening, everything people were experiencing. And I think we held probably nine altogether. Apart from actually being fantastic to be able to speak to people face to face during that first lockdown, to share issues, all of what we learned is incredibly helpful for us planning ahead uh, because we will be working in a completely different way. Another of those things that we did in those early heady days of the first lockdown was work with AIM, the Association of Independent Music, on a digital version of AIM House, which would normally have happened at The Great Escape, but which went online. And we provided panels on the sectors in East Asia and Latin America, and we also helped to promote AIM House. Uh, and I think we were very instrumental in helping to draw in the 14,000 participants from 86 countries. We also partnered with the Huddersfield Contemporary Music Festival, inviting international delegates to the festival last year and featuring the Lebanese experimental music scene. And that was a real example of the long-term work that we like to do. We helped Festival Irtijal from Beirut visit Huddersfield some years ago, and the festivals have been talking ever since. And we were able to bring um, the first part of an impressive partnership together last November at the Digital Festival. We're thinking hard about climate change as well, COVID and climate change, uh, both I think interlinked, and how they're going to affect the work of an international organisation like the British Council. We know that nothing will be the same again, and we know that we're going to be delivering a lot of digital work in future. We also know that face-to-face -face is incredibly important, and when we can, we will resume that, but we will resume that, I think, in, in a very different way. We're going to be concentrating on the kinds of initiatives like the musicians in residence, which involve artists traveling for a longer period, a longer stay and a deeper dive, or as we, we describe it in our team, longer, slower, deeper. Um, and I think this 
is what we're hearing from others in the sector that this is of interest going forwards. And also, I've just seen the results of the British Council's call for climate change creative commissions, which are going to be announced shortly, uh, and that's very exciting. So I hope that's given you an idea of how we work and what we do, uh, and that those of you who knew us already learned something new. I've only just scratched the surface. Um, I haven't mentioned, for example, all the work we're doing at the moment with music and film. Um, through our own FamLab, which brings musicians and composers together to explore the world of music, archive and film for a lab week involving practical scoring workshops, discussions, knowledge sharing, and a chance to hear from some of the UK's most experienced voices in the field. Uh, or in Vision Sound, for example, our music and film programme with Ukraine. Or I could speak about our work with music and technology or many, many other programmes, but I'm going to stop here and just invite you to look at our website uh, where you can get um, up-to-date information. I'll also mention that the British Council Arts Department often has opportunities, calls for various programmes, um, open calls that you can apply to. Um, and I will make sure that both our website address and the opportunities web link are available to you. So just to say, I'm really looking forward to meeting you all and to discussing some of the vital issues facing us and to discover how we too can work much more intensively towards supporting talent development. Well, in fact, by the time you hear me speak, uh, we'll already have enjoyed two days together. So I hope by this stage, we'll have met all of us. So please enjoy the day ahead. Um, many thanks to Leah Zachs, my colleague, who has created, uh, curated this on behalf of the British Council. And many, many thanks to the PRS Foundation for both this conference and for all it's doing for our sector at the moment. Thanks very much. Hello and welcome to the, uh, the next session, which is um, about international perspectives on uh, music talent development. And thank you uh, to the to PRS Foundation for inviting British Council to host this session. Uh, my name is Leah Zachs and I work as part of the British Council's UK music team um, developing cultural relations um, projects across different parts of the world. And I've got four fantastic speakers with me here today to talk about the work they do in their countries. Um, I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves very briefly to start with before we, we move on to talking about um, individual uh, contexts. So um, Zena, do you want to uh, kick off? All right, thank you again for the invitation. I'm really happy to be part of this uh, great event. Uh, my name is Zainab Yedira. I'm uh, from Morocco and I'm representing uh, Fondation Hiba or Hiba Foundation, which is a nonprofit organization based in Morocco and uh, basically working on uh, arts and culture uh, in the country. And um, I must recognize that we have a big uh, focus on music industry and we do a lot in the music industry, but not only. <laughs> Thank you. And David? Uh, yeah, I'm David Tessel. I live and work in Uganda and uh, we run a music distribution company focusing on digital music. And we also have a recording studio in Kampala, actually two recording studios now. And we uh, help artists to develop creatively and to understand how the online music industry works. So that's yeah, pretty much it. We also have a load of side jobs in film and yeah, so I'm in the kind of media hustle of East Africa. Thank you. Darko, Swaylai Tet, I should say. Uh, <laughs> commonly commonly known as Darko. Yeah, you pronounce it very well uh, because <laughs> it's a bit um, hard to say my name, right? Right, okay, um, my name is Dago and I, I'm the director of a non-profit social enterprise called Talent Tables Myanmar. And me, myself, uh, is an artist and I've been in a band called Side Effect, which plays uh, indie kind of rock, you know, since 2004. And, and we're still playing. 
So we are an artist run uh, social enterprise working with uh, youth in Myanmar for bridging the vibe through music or sometime, you know, we work for social uh, cohesion, uh, traveling across the country, you know, giving trainings, inviting, uh, you know, like uh, youth from different communities and, you know, building their skill sets and also, yeah, like facilitating, uh, you know, uh, you know, this uh, facilitating the programs, you know, programs to, uh, let them meet each other and to let them exchange ideas and to learn about each other and also to discover about themselves. So, and we are, you know, like we are, we are in such an enterprise working with you through like, like music and film, uh, not only music, we also make films and music videos. And through this like products, we are, you know, solving the problems in Myanmar. Thank you. And you, Zhao Yu. Hi, everyone. My name is Zhao Yu. Uh, I'm based in Beijing, China. Uh, I run the Pelican Music Academy and a small indie label called Mary Records. Um, although we call it an academy, it's not actually a school, but a series of mostly online events and content that could serve the musicians and hardcore fans alike. Um, right now, we are mainly running a live uh, streaming series and a podcast, uh, but we plan on bringing back more offline events later this year. Yeah. Thank you. So um, that's a great introduction. And we wanted to hear a little bit more about the, the, the cultural context, the music context in each case here. So um, just moving back to Zainab for a minute. Can you tell us a little bit more about the work you do in music specifically and what talent development means to you? What are the creative and career barriers you face and how okay. does a Hiba Foundation look to, to address those? Okay, well, so many questions in only one, so I'll try to be a bit brief. Um, Basically, uh, in Morocco, the music industry is like an emerging in industry. It's something new. That we, we've always have had uh, uh, artists, of course, and musicians. And the Moroccan music is one of the most uh, uh, like um, uh, diversified in the world. So it's not a, a matter of creation of uh, existence of uh, heritage, but it's uh, it's a um, what I think what the difficulty for Morocco is to go from um, like popular music and traditional music to and to transform this to an, a real industry. So we are in um, uh, like in um, it, it, we are, what we are trying to do in Fondation Hiba is uh, uh, contribute to this transformation and make uh, music not only a passion for uh, for artists but also uh, a job and uh, a way of living. So that's the main uh, objective we have. So uh, we have developed many uh, projects uh, basically that intervene in the whole value chain of uh, the music industry. So we are starting with the creation and also um, the, the production and then the, how do you say that, broadcasting or diffusion. Um, so uh, the, uh, well, we, First, we have the chance to have a great recording studio in Casablanca, and uh, that's very important because it contributes a lot, a lot, a lot to improve uh, the production, the music production. So actually, we use this tool to um, help emerging artists uh, do things better, let's say it this way. They are very talented, but they need to be uh, supported to 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 like to step up in their musical uh, career. So we have this program called uh, Hibarek, which is uh, so a support program for emerging artists. Basically, we choose um, around twelve artists a year. Let's forget twenty twenty, of course, but normally, in average, it's around tw twelve artists a year. And what we do is uh, uh, record them. Uh, well only one song, but it's still, it's a song uh, that we, uh, of course, record, mix, and master at the highest standards. And also what we do is uh, to offer them uh, tools to be able to promote uh, their music. So uh, uh, 
uh, we give uh, and it's something that could appear very basic to someone some people but it's very very important and we are at this level of uh, of uh, maturity in the sector i would say so basically what we do is give them uh, uh, photo shootings, uh, making a video of their session so that the people can also understand their creative process, for example. And also uh, either we, we do a, a lyric video or we give a subsidy to help them produce their own uh, video clip. So um, that's basically what we do with, with this program. It's uh, great to have this recording studio again. And um, and actually, now that we have launched this program in uh, 2016, I think, uh, we have many uh, institutions that are interested in it and that are willing to uh, support also artists and even more artists. We can do 12, for example, a year. But now um, we, we used to work with the, the British Council actually locally uh, on a, a similar program. So we also um, did that with uh, in, in this specific uh, context. And um, now we are working with the, the, the local uh, office of the UNESCO also on a support program program like this. This is, of course, a part of the uh, support uh, uh, of what we do in um, supporting the music production, but we also uh, have a concert hall in Rabat in the capital city. So uh, basically in normal times, let's say, we organize many, many concerts. Um, we uh, we have the chance to have like a beautiful place and uh, we really use it as much as possible to give the opportunity to emerging artists and, and more uh, professional artists too, to, um, to, to, to be able to go on stage and perform in front of their uh, audience. Um, and also, uh, well, actually we, what we do is also supporting all the whole uh, creative sector, not only in music, and we have launched, for example, the, the resource center, which is a, a tool, a online tool that uh, allows uh, um, all the professionals actually to, to, um, to exchange and to meet and to discuss and uh, all, at least have information. I'm an artist, I'm looking for a manager. Okay, so go on the resource center and you will find all the managers that are, that are re registered in the resource center. So we are at this uh, stage where we have to put all the basis of having a, a music industry in Morocco. And I think it's working well. We have developed um, I would say a festival tradition in Morocco. You were asking about the context. I think that now uh, uh, young people, the youth actually, uh, have access uh, to has access to music through two ways. Of course, all the digital parts of it through the platforms and so on. That's uh, obvious, and that's the main uh, way for them to uh, have access to music. But we have also developed this tradition of festivals, which is a good thing because we have hundreds of festivals in Morocco and uh, starting from traditional music to world music to uh, uh, pop music and all the kind of, uh, kinds of music and this is great but we can discuss it later and let, let my colleagues speak also but uh, there are a lot of issues that are uh, be, uh, part uh, that are the consequence of this uh, of this uh, tradition let's say. <laughs> Thank you, Zainab. And just before we move on, can you just say something about your role in the Visa for Music Festival and Showcase, which, for those who don't know, is a kind of Pan-African, Middle East uh, yeah, well, music event? Yeah, uh, Visa for Music is the first, um, let's say, uh, music meeting uh, for African and uh, Middle East music. Um, we, we are not the main... Um, we are not the owners of the, 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 festival, the festival, but we supported it since the first day, in, uh, which means uh, the first edition, which means uh, 2014. And um, so we, we, we helped the organization of the, of the event and uh, we still do. And we also host um, the, the showcases in our concert hall. Actually, we have two um, stages, so we host uh, the major parts, I would say, of, um, of the concerts. And uh, yeah, we, we are like co-organizers.
organizers, I would say, but we are not the owners of the, the event. And it's, uh, we, we are really, really proud of what have been done because um, uh, even with all the difficulties that the, the, the festival faced, um, uh, for example, in terms of, uh, of uh, subsidies, of course, and finance, um, we um, managed to keep it alive. And, uh, and I think the festival is growing and uh, contributing more and more to the development and to the, uh, yeah, to, to, uh, to the development of uh, African and Middle East and Caribbean also music worldwide. Thank you, Zainab. Um, that's a brilliant introduction. Um, we're going to go a bit south and a bit east now to David and his work with East African Records. Um, David, tell us a little bit about talent development, um, what that means for you and, and how you've come to be doing what you're doing. I know it's a long and colourful story. <laughs> Yeah, okay, well, uh, just to quickly sketch the context first. Um, the challenge that we think the East African music industry faces, and um, let me focus on Uganda because that's the place I know best. There's so much music being made there. Uh, it's now so cheap and easy to set up a studio, a home studio that like, you can, I mean, pretty much anyone can get something recorded for a relatively low cost. And so that throws up the challenge, first of all, of like quality. And so there's a lot of music being made that really could, could, it could be a hit on the local market, but it's not likely to reach an international audience. So that's one challenge. Another challenge is people make music, but they don't really know what to do with it once they've made it. So how do we get it out? How do we attract fans? How do we um, monetize it? How do we copyright it? So though, you know, there's a kind of uh, a huge gap between the content production and then proper channels of distribution and monetization and let's say legislation, legalization of, the, of that content. So like that's a sketch of the context. Uh, and then I'll just quickly outline the ways in which we tried to address those issues as we saw them. So is, is that the right time to talk about this or shall I talk about that later? No, go, go for it and maybe say okay. a little bit about your, um, your co-directors and their roles as well. Absolutely. So in 2016, roughly, um, me and a friend from Norway and a friend from a Ugandan friend decided to set up East African Records, which is a distribution company, digital only. Uh, we do online distribution. Uh, and the idea again was to fill this kind of gap, like once artists have made music, how do they get it out to the outside world? And we developed a partnership with a very good distribution company from Norway. And since then, we've moved on through a couple of partners and we're now working with a British distribution company called Ditto Music, who are excellent, really positive and proactive partners. And one of the things they do is they share all of their research and technical and uh, industry expertise with us. So we have weekly meetings. We have weekly meetings with Ditto Music and we then pass on the information that they give us at these weekly meetings. And it's everything from like how to maximize your streams on TikTok to resolving complicated copyright issues um, to new promotion strategies that have emerged. So we have these two, I have two weekly meetings with Ditto and then I kind of talk to the artists as relevant. Hey, have you heard about this? Have you heard about that? And um, so, yeah, so that's a key element of what we do. We provide distribution and we also provide uh, updates constantly on changes in the music industry. Um, monetization of digital in the digital music market is notoriously hard. It's very difficult to make money by through streaming. But we always tell people that streaming isn't only about selling music, it's about creating a presence for yourself. So then we also give them rather like Zainab, we kind of you know, explain the basics to people, like get your video shoot done, get your photo shoot done, branding, local marketing, international marketing, how that works. Is your output as an artist suitable for the international or local market? 
when we find an artist has a particular potential for the international market, maybe they've made a really good reggae track with a strong hook in English or something like that. We're like, aha, then we, we will take their music and we pitch it to a bunch of media contacts. So we have like uh, a, a kind of reasonably good network of festival uh, media, DJ, radio contacts, which, and then when I get an international release, so-called, we pitch that to them. So yeah, and then um, a word on our studios. We, we operate like one main studio uh, where we have a live band recording facility so we can record live acts and they can rehearse there. And we also do the majority of our work, which is kind of urban music, you know, a producer with an MC. Uh, and that's our kind of main day-to-day -day work. But um, we're trying to encourage live music in, in Uganda. It's such a shame that the digital revolution created this opportunity for the live music scene to die you know it's such a it's almost ironic that suddenly this new tool appears that almost for me has started killing music it's it's stimulated it in one way and is killing it in another way so we want to try and bring back live music and the relevance of that then we we have another studio which we call our corporate or commercial studio which is in a very posh location and easy to reach. And that one we're developing more as something just to kind of try and make some money. You know, we're, we've struggled to make money <laughs> on every level. Um, we do a bit of corporate work, but we, yeah, we're, we're in it for the love. We're here for the love. Um, but yeah, you know, we're struggling financially. I think that's a, it's a problem everyone faces in the music industry. So I'm not going to complain about that. But I think like every, you know, we also try and help the artists how to understand how to make money. And once again, it's live music, you know, as Zainab uh, pointed out in her presentation, um, you know, th th this last year has been an absolute murderous year for all artists, because what's your main source of income? It's shows, you know, and if it's not shows, it's getting out there and traveling a lot and meeting DJs and trying to promote face to face, which is so important. And losing that has been a big issue, but we'll come to that bit later. I hope I've sketched out enough about what we do. Thank you, David, that's brilliant. Um, we're gonna move over to Darko in Myanmar and the very um, special and unique context that you're working in. And um, yeah, tell us a little bit more about Turning Tables. Um, we are an activist organization, you know, um, but we are business minded, but we are a nonprofit. So, you know, it's a bit um, unique here, especially here in Myanmar. I mean, I heard some like cool, like organization like this PRS and other organizations are doing like uh, culture based or you know music based activities um, you know for the you know developments or or you know like uh, for the impact in many other things but here in Myanmar we are new and uh, we are we are viewed as kind of like you know uh, something hard to understand I think you know from a little bit distance because are they having fun or are they really serious about solving these issues? You know what I mean? Because, you know, because we look like we are just like a group of rock and roll uh, mm, having fun. But actually yeah, that's, that's one thing, you know, because of the uh, look and the form and actually the work that we've been doing, it's, um, it's uh, mainly about, uh, you know, like here, I mean, Myanmar has a lot of problems, uh, you know, a lot of, ethnic problems and a lot of racial problems. So I, as a musician, I, I, I believe the music is a fundamental social glue. And, you know, yeah, it can, uh, I, I mean, it can literally enable, you know, like individuals to open up and, uh, you know, connect with uh, like somebody from uh, like, you know, outside of your network of communities uh, through my personal experience. So I invested a lot of my time and energy in it. And uh, with the help of like, you know, very like-minded uh, artists slash musicians, uh, we've been working uh, like kind of like, you know, um, for uh, like a social cohesion and a peace process and also like a freedom of like pushing the limits of freedom of expression through like different activities. So it, it, like activities that we've been doing uh, doing our like uh, like kind of like this uh, music and social cohesion workshop, which which would normally take like ten days program, where we invite uh, where we 
invited like you know different uh, youth from different uh, tribes or different ethnicity, different religions, and uh, you know we we let them make music together. We let them you know interact, and also we we facilitated a session where they you know discussed about the um, issues like peace issues and also about civil war and about this like race racial issues. You know, in that way we actually, but we the background is it with the Myanmar culture. We it seems like we are not allowed to talk about those things, especially when you are young. You know, because you don't know anything yet. Because there are many people who know better than you, and you are not supposed to question or criticize what your leader said. That's 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 a normal conservative uh, what do you call it culture. But you know, we are. This is like we are working with kind of like uh, diff, um, what do you call it? Kind of like a progressive youth, I would say. You know, who would like to push the limits? Because that's our skill to you know um, map this youth across the country, and then we are doing that kind of thing. And also, one of the thing that we've been doing is a uh, like massive music festival called Voice of the Youth Music Festival. We started it in uh, 2015, and um, at that time there was still we were still like um, I mean freedom of censorship was very limited. So the first year we did it in the French Institute compound, where we did not need uh, the permission for the festival, and where we uh, were safe to speak uh, whatever we want to say from the stage. But apart from that right now, when now we pushed pretty much like for what? So now we are, we are not in fear of what we said through music, but still, you know, we still push the limits on like freedom of expression and also like, I don't know, like uh, pointing out the problems in our country through music where we cannot discuss, you know, like there are many things that we are not supposed to discuss culturally or politically, especially, you know? Our political system is very repressive still. So you know, we we've been we've been uh, working on that part uh, like um, very strongly until COVID happened. So we are pretty much slowed down, and uh, yeah, we are coping with setback pretty much currently. Thanks, Durko, and I think we're going to come back to how COVID has affected us all in different ways in a moment. Um, over to China and uh, Zhao Yu and uh, Pelican Music Academy. Now you said that it's not an academy, um, but I know that you've done some really interesting work around uncovering and sharing aspects of the creative process, um, technical know-how, and even uh, produced a guidebook for artists, um, which I assume is only in Chinese. Yeah, but, exactly. Um, <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit more about how Pelican Music Academy came about? Because, of course, you also are a team who runs record label. Um, mm -hmm. What pre-COVID? How are you working at least? Mm, sure. Um, but let me go back to a, a little bit to like talent development. Um, for us in China, uh, we are so much less political. <laughs> I, um, I think I, I consider talent development from two main aspects. Uh, one is about sharing industry knowledge and creating a peer support system for musicians. And the other is providing them with um, a more diverse public events or projects where they can get more media exposure as they learn and create. Um, the reason for this conclusions is that um, I think there are like several uh, factors that's uh, specific to where China is right now. So on one hand, the majority of Chinese uh, musicians are still rather amateurish. Um, so is the industry because this is a, it's rather young compared to the West. We basically started this modern music industry back in the 80s. Um, so like the infra infrastructures is not very, um, uh, it's just not complete yet. And uh, uh, like uh, from what I've seen, 
the musicians, many of them don't even know like how to manage their, their own shows. They don't know what to expect from working with a label. Uh, they don't know how to create, uh, like record a record properly and get it distributed digitally even. So that's, that, that's definitely one key issue. That's why I think they need industry knowledge. And on the other hand, uh, there are just uh, so many of them and because of all the major platforms, because of the, the rise of TikTok, there are just uh, so much more, so many more musicians right, right now, at least over, uh, this is definitely not a complete data, but at least uh, 300,000 musicians are trying to self-release. And this has been like a rise of at least five folds uh, in the past five years. Um, so I just uh, think they, um, they need uh, they need industry help and also they need to find more channels where the best musicians can jump out quickly. Uh, and as I said, like the industry for artist development is in general is ra rather lacking in China. Um, the main streaming platforms are trying to take some of these res responsibilities. They are trying to do some artist development and the selections themselves. And I would give credit to them. They've done a, 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 a good, good enough job, I think. Um, but you know, there are only so many banners on the platform. So there are still like so many musicians are going uh, under the radar. So what we are trying to do is to basically go from a more um, grassroots level uh, to uh, provide two things. Like one is education and the other is potentially more opportunities for them to, uh, to stand out. Uh, we, like the Pelican Music Academy was created uh, in the late, at the end of 2019. Uh, the first thing we've done is actually, yeah, created a guidebook. It's a, it's a hard copy, but we also have like uh, all, all the stuff mentioned in this book is uh, uh, condensed into like online posts as well. So this book is rather simple. It, it talks about self-release, talks about home studio, talks about basic legal issues, and even like how to work with commercial brands, things like that. Um, and uh, that has received like a great, well, like a warm welcome. It's, it's sold out already. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, we, we tried to, uh, the first event we've done was a four day summit slash like mini festivals. So we've given uh, opportunities for the artists to perform and uh, to get, get looked at by industry people like potential uh, label owners and platform people so they can get uh, they can get better connections um, but like I know compared to all you guys the, the Pelican Music Academy is very very young it's only like this the beginning of well it's it, in its entirety it's been only like a little over a year Thank you. Yeah. And um, you mentioned TikTok and I'm sure when we spoke the other week, you were you were planning on a new project that involves yes. TikTok. Can you tell us a little bit more about that out of sheer curiosity? <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, there are like we have um, there are potentially like two routes we want to go. Uh, one is for musicians. And uh, this is more about music education. Like we wanted to do little clips of uh, like production tips or industry knowledge tips. Like each episode will be like one minute long or something and will be quite easily done and uh, well, cheaply done, I mean. And uh, this is for sharing industry knowledge as soon as, uh, as possible. And uh, the other way, uh, this is like, mm, more based on what TikTok is, is we think we could probably expand the concept of the academy further to uh, reach more like general general public because even the idea of indie music is still not very well known in China. But like TikTok is a very uh, popular and booming platform for everyone. There are like over, I don't know, like uh, seven thousand. I, I can't do the numbers, like a gigantic number of, of people on TikTok. So we think it might be a good idea to just spread some music knowledge, like the fun facts, the stories, 
uh, to the general public. So in that case, like we basically are growing uh, uh, audience ship for the in uh, indie musicians. We think that's worthwhile doing as well. And uh, it's just a fun doing TikTok. Thank you. That would be my opinion. <laughs> Um, I wanted to ask a question about, uh, and it's something that a lot of UK organisations will be looking very carefully at and already working on, which is about working with uh, music and marginalised communities um, where you are, um, people who may not be afforded equal opportunities for whatever reason, um, who may be marginalised due to ethnicity, to gender, to disability, sexuality or even geography. It's something that you talked a little bit about just now, uh, Darko, but I wondered if um, anyone else wanted to expand on that and talk about how you might be actively addressing that kind of work. Darko, do you want to say a little bit more? Yeah, sure. Um, I don't know where should I start? Um, where I should start? Wait. Uh, many of which part sounds more interesting to you like uh, like ethnic part or gender part I think both yeah. <laughs> yeah. whatever okay. you'd like to tell us about where you're working with okay you. okay but I mean culturally like with the with the Burmese culture Burmese or Myanmar whatever you call it uh, sometimes it's different sometimes the same but you know for those like who is uh, who is not very familiar with Myanmar context um, yeah, with the latest, latest uh, definitions, uh, like Myanmar is, uh, I mean, the whole uh, country's population. Uh, that's that's how they describe Myanmar people. And Burmese uh, came from Burma, uh, ethnic city. You know, like Burma is one of the, like many uh, other ethnic cities, like which is like um, 135 officially registered ethnic cities in Myanmar. So Burma is one of them, but I mean, uh, but you know, they are majority on privileged ethnic city uh, are Burma people. You know, that, that, that's the um, like community, that's where I came from. You know, I'm from like privileged group. So, you know, I mean with it, because you know, Burmese culture dominate the whole country's culture. So which is mean like gender is, I don't know, like I mean, women in general, they just basically, accepted uh, the setup, you know, social setup, which is like, which bars them to be equally um, able to play or sing or perform uh, with men. You know, they are restricted culturally first, because for example, in the family, in the family, if you are a girl, you, are, you will never be encouraged to go up to stage and I don't know, form a band or to be a drummer don't even think about it. Now it's 2021 and the culture is stayed like this. But you know, like Christian culture mm, is exceptional because you know, Christianity bring uh, music, you know, to their lives too. So, you know, since their children and women from Christian community can play pretty much. Uh, that's the that's the gender part of it, you know, and geographically from the marginalized group also, um, it's almost impossible for them to be a star. You know, I haven't uh, I haven't heard many artists that came from marginalized uh, group, which is um, not great for me. Which is why we are doing the work, you know, harder than ever because you know we could never do such things uh, like I don't know eight years ago or seven years ago and this is new thing that Myanmar can do now so you know fixing the problem or at least talking about the problem is a new thing you know so that's the context um what should I say oh yeah marginalized group were actually you know let the language itself too you know because you know all these ethnicity have their own languages the thing is, you know, if they don't sing in Burmese language and then they are not going anywhere. But like you know, for those like, like who have a like big population in Myanmar, like for example, Rakhine people, Rakhine people, they've been releasing their own music with their own language and they've been selling pretty well within their own communities. You know, like they, they, are, they are some exceptional ethnicity in Myanmar. Uh, 
that's basically the setup. But you know, the culture and the structure and setup is a, you know, it was not very long ago. It was almost like yesterday, or like the, it was less than ten years that where you know all these, um, what do you call it? Uh, a little changes happen. Before it was only that most of the musicians came from their music uh, musician backgrounds, which means like you know, like I mean, you are supposed to be I don't know son or daughter of some famous musician in the past or currently, you know what I mean? So if you don't have any networks, you can do it because I mean, you can hardly make money out of it. So it's more like hobby thing, you know, hobby or pride thing. You know what I mean? You know, to be a star or, you know. So most of the artists or slash musicians came from the rich families, like until like, I don't know, 10 or 15 years ago. But now it is still, you know, like with the, you know, like this new setup of this like digitalization of the production and, you know, like you can now make music with computer and a microphone like this and stuff like that. So, you know, there are, there are, there are new, uh, new way of like uh, new generations are coming in, making a lot of music also, but they are only releasing, most of them are releasing through a platform called Dukes. I'm not sure if you are aware of the platform Dukes. They are almost, they seem like the only application uh, winning in Myanmar, you know, because we cannot, we can hardly sell our music on iTunes, Spotify, or no, not Spotify, it's not selling, uh, yeah iTunes, Amazon, and stuff like that, you know, to go to international market, it's almost impossible. Only a few people can do that because of this, uh, you know, complicated, uh, what do you call it, um, structures uh, of the limitations of the, you know, bank transfer to Myanmar and stuff like that. So very complicated right now. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, Zainab or, and or David, um, I just wondered, and this is partly because of work the British Council's done with Punch Records uh, in Morocco, working with some of the southern cities there. How easy is it to um, reach out to and uh, support uh, talent in the non-main cities, the non-capital cities, um, cities that are further out, but where there may be burgeoning talent or scenes. Is that is that harder to do? And is that part of your remit to do that? Um, well, I can start. Um, well, that's a difficult question. And uh, yeah, it's a, it's a real uh, issue because uh, the reality is that uh, the, the, the main uh, artistic, um, let's say activity is uh, mainly based in the major cities so uh, Rabat of course the capital city but also Casablanca a bit of Marrakesh Tangier and that's it and when you go to smaller cities uh, nothing happens and uh, of course we know that the talent starts uh, in of course music schools and also uh, it can start uh, while going to a concert or while participating to different kind of uh, things. So um, in many smaller cities and also, well, let's say what, what I would call a cultural deserts, deserts, deserts in, uh, in Morocco, it's, um, it's very hard to, um, to to, to make people get interested in music. They know their local music, their traditional music, but they are not open to uh, international music and also other uh, music from other regions of the country or, or different kinds of music. Uh, now things are changing uh, thanks to the digital things. And that's, uh, I, I totally agree with David saying that live music is very, very important and we support that very much. But I must say that the, the digital thing um, has contributed to democratize the access to music in a way. Uh, I think it's not enough uh, to make people um, uh, open to different kinds of music, but still it contributes to it very well. So basically in our programs, what we do is try to have artists from all over the country. So uh, for example, in the last session we had a a great artist from Tangier, but also from uh, um, the northeast of Morocco, uh, the region of uh, 
uh, Ujda and Oriental, also people coming from the um, Saharan part of the country and so on. So we try to have this diversity and uh, we try to bring those artists. But of course, uh, they are facing day to day uh, difficulties because they don't know how to uh, to go live. They don't know how to, they don't even have access to in the infrastructures and so on. So we're yeah. With our uh, programs, we try to uh, to, um, to 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 um, uh, to overpass these barriers, but uh, we are of course aware of all these uh, uh, difficulties. Yeah, um, fascinating. Thanks, Zainab. I love Morocco. I've been there a couple of times, and uh, I appreciate the. Um, you know, I found the rural areas the most delightful. So I would love to hear music coming out of the mountains and yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, I would say um, it's very difficult, um, you know, rather like Darko, I don't quite know where to begin with marginalization in Uganda because it's such a big topic. Uh, but I'd like to focus on uh, two briefly and then one in a bit of detail. So I would say the first two I'd like to focus on briefly are, um, let's say, ethnic marginalization, but we could also just call that regional, as both of the previous speakers have said. It's very much connected with the big regional blocks. Who is the dominant region and what's it like to be an artist outside the dominant city or province? So we have a central province called Buganda, which is where the capital city is, and it's the most widely spoken language. Even if you're not from there, you'll understand it because you kind of have to. It's like the trading language. And so if you're from outside those areas, the only way to get your music like really understood is either to, to sing uh, in the local, dom sorry, the national language, the dominant language of Luganda, or you have to be really rich and be able to bribe all the radio stations to play your music and pay for really expensive videos. Um, so I'll come back to that in a second. Then there's gender. So um, with gender uh, marginalization, there's two types. One, one is obvious, which is women uh, that have a, have a barrier to enter into the music. Then, um, I, so the, the biggest marginalization in my experience is economic. And so basically, talent in Uganda rises with the size of your wallet. If you're rich, you can make good videos, you can bribe the radio DJs. And that's a very, very big issue in Uganda. There's no equality on the radio. You get play if you pay. That's it. And it doesn't matter how good your music is, 90% of radio DJs will not play it unless you're paying them. And it's shocking and, and, and disgraceful, actually. So when we, you know, the, the way around that, we say is use social media. And we really encourage artists to try and find platforms online away from the mainstream radios. Then develop relationships with the more positive and productive, uh, let me say, the, the DJs who are more switched on, who are into music. We try and develop relationships with those guys and try and link artists to particular DJs. And that brings us back to the ethnic marginalization. One tactic we found was, it's very obvious, but very effective is if an artist is from a particular ethnic group, we say, okay, go back to the village, find the DJs there. And then that's really working. And we occasionally try and help them to do that. And one of the next big stages actually in our development as a company is to take our distribution service and our key artists up country to go to the villages, put on concerts, engage with the radio stations and develop those direct relationships. Yeah, but yeah, I think that, you know, I know that artists everywhere complain about like, oh, I'm broke, but somehow in Uganda, it's much more harsh and black and white. Like if you're rich, you can make it. If you're not, you won't. So that's a massive challenge. And we, we hope that we can use the internet to overcome that. Thank you, David. Um, Joe, yeah, before we ask about how COVID has changed things and there's only so much time we have to uh, to kind of delve into it, but um, any of those topics, um, do any of those resonant, resonate with you in terms of China, its vastness, um, 
cities versus you know the, the well even the smaller cities are vast in China right but um what what would you like to share with us I feel like um I'm not informed enough to speak on that topic um because I I hear all you, you, you are deeply rooted in your local like political and uh, uh, social, uh, you, you, you've obviously paid a lot of attention to that. Uh, and I have to say that uh, in a lot of ways, we are luckier in that respect. And uh, I don't see a lot of uh, gender discriminations in, uh, in the Chinese music industry. Uh, nor like a class, we don't really have a class distinction. Um, obviously, like if you are rich or if you have a rich daddy, uh, you have a like a better chance to succeed. But it's not too it's not too bad. And uh, I know there are some minority groups issues, uh, especially in Xinjiang and stuff. But um, I have to admit, I don't know too much about those. <laughs> I, I don't, yeah. And uh, like uh, from where, uh, from where I am, uh, we mostly work with uh, urban, like uh, no, in urban in the Chinese sense, not like in the African sense. Like we we mostly work with uh, city dwellers, and uh, uh, I would say the majority of our audience group are these people as well. And uh, yeah, I, I, I don't have much to share. Sorry. Now, there's some fantastic female talent I know you're supporting um, uh, as part of the, the, the label. Um, I mean, people like Shi from Wuhan, who have worked with us in collaboration with Love Sega and with Worldwide FM. Um, it's fantastic to discover um, the work that she's producing. Um, and uh, I hope there'll be many more like her to come that we can, we can hear from China. Um, Okay, so Zainab, um, how has COVID 2020 was uh, devastating for us all in different ways? Um, some people have found new ways to work. Some people have all but shut down, at least for the time being. Um, how's it been for you? And, um, you know, have the needs of artists changed? Um, I would say that, um... The issues that Morocco, that the, the Moroccan music industry faced before COVID, uh, um, like 2020 has just uh, put them in the light, I would say. It's not something that happened because of COVID, uh, but it's just that COVID showed how difficult it was to, uh, for, uh, to, uh, to, 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 for an artist to live with his music because uh, uh, it, it was hard and it's still hard and it's even harder today. So it's, it just made things uh, even more complicated. Um, and I think that it showed that uh, there are some, again, some um, uh, basics that are uh, missing in uh, the Moroccan industry. I would say, speak, of course, about all the legal thing because uh, uh, what we uh, understood is that the, the, actually the artist has no status in our country, I mean, uh, they had nothing to uh, live with. They, they, uh, they there is, uh, there are many, so many issues regarding the legal status, but also all the things that are related, for example, to the copyrights. So basically, many artists uh, dropped many, many things and released many uh, songs and so on. But we know that they can't make their living from this. Um, in Morocco because the copyrights are, uh, copyrights are not uh, protected uh, or at least are not protected enough. So uh, these are uh, uh, big issues that have been uh, showed uh, in 2020. And um, from our uh, perspective, uh, well, of course we had so much difficulties, so many difficulties uh, in this period and uh, well, for example, our cinema closed, so part of our incomes uh, were uh, stopped, basically. And uh, but we feel lucky anyway because we have uh, no, uh, we didn't have uh, major financial difficulties, and we are also because we are not, our projects are not only related to um, uh, to a place or uh, to. Uh, like to uh, not only for uh, we are not only um, 
uh, doing uh, music uh, concerts and so on because all this part of our activity stopped, of course, but we just moved on to new things and to other projects. And we basically worked on this uh, resource center, which uh, it was a good opportunity for us to focus on, uh, on other kinds of projects. And, um, and we could do that because um, we, we are not only dependent on our, uh, uh, like on, the, on the, 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 the cinema incomes and so on. So we feel a bit lucky. And I think uh, um, we are not representative of the, 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 all the difficulties that happen in this sector because um, many companies stopped. I know a recording and rehearsing studio who, uh, who uh, stopped its, its activity. I know uh, uh, many, many, many professionals suffering from this situation. And of course, the, the major um, victims the 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 the, the most um, the biggest victims are the artists and uh, um it's it's very sad to see that and the, the which is more difficult is uh, not to have any visibility on what's going on uh, in the couple of uh, coming months i mean we don't know if it's uh, gonna stop in two months or six or a year or two or I don't know what. And um, there is no vaccine today in Morocco. Not, still no vaccines are arriving in Morocco. So, uh, so yeah, I think uh, now the artists and the professionals uh, need visibility, and I think it's the right moment to. Um, uh, to question the place of the artist in our society and what we would like to do with our artists. Uh, are, there, are they important and why are they important in our country and how can we protect them uh, in those difficult moments? Because of course, no concerts, no uh, release of music, no income. So um, how to deal with this? I think it's uh, the major, um, uh, issue that we have to uh, discuss and also to solve, of course. Thank you, Zainab. Um, Darko, how has COVID affected what you do locally and the artists that you work with? Uh, pretty severe and intense, of, of course. Uh, I myself was in a very severe depression um, you know, last year. Uh, yeah, I met a lot of, for example, like, you know, before we, this is, this is our new office, before we moved to this, like, new office, say, you know, we used to have a better studio and, you know, like, where we could, like, you know, record live and uh, videotape it. So, you know, we, we, we could make, um, like, series of, you know, what I mean, performances, videos, such as, like, KXP, YouTube, uh, you know, videos stuff like that. But that's when, you know, last November, December, we, you know, spread the news secretly for the for those artists that I knew from uh, through my network, like just to give them free studio time to come and play and, you know, make something, I don't know, no, to, to do something to keep themselves sane. But then they were so depressed that nobody showed up. No one literally showed up. They did not do anything. They could not do anything. Only a few of them uh, made some music and launched it on, you know, social media. So that was their psychological, you know, damages. But the uh, other thing is like, you know, uh, yeah, of course there was no exception about like public gathering. So there's no events for more than like now. I think yeah, it's almost a year. No, not even like single I mean time later event because the government whatever you do you really need permission from the government and of course like the government will never issue a permission for your event but it, election uh, was exceptional right that that was election so the, the government believed in that election and there were a lot of people but you know they believe it's okay but for us, it's, it's, it's not okay to gather, I don't know, like uh, a few people, like less than 100 or something like that. We are restricted. But for us, for alternative Tables the major blow was the donors, donors withdrawal. I mean, the donors uh, belief system changed. 
I mean, we can hardly blame them because you know they are also their sources of the donation um, also became limited, right? So they they are also like, yeah, wait a minute, you know, what do we do now? Kind of mentality. They have it. So I mean, like I think it's like the rest of the world, music and the culture value are set aside as if they are less important than many other things in life. But maybe for most of them, you know, maybe we are less important than them. But I mean, you know, I mean, artists and the musician have been, uh, you know, like taking the major role in, uh, you know, society, so psychological well-being, also physical well-being to, you know, to, to generate, I mean, to generate happiness in our body or, you know, many other, you know, we've been contributing many other values in life, you know, in the world, but now we are locked and set aside as less important. And there's a risk that like, you know, then, then many artists would probably go through this depression or, you know, suicidal tendencies or, I don't know, I don't know, no, I don't see how we can, uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, come back, to, you know, come back to normal or, you know, to stand back on our feet. Right now, it, it's like that, you know, I mean, we don't know when the restriction will be lifted. And I don't see, I don't think it's possible for like more than six months from now on. So, you know, we don't know it. Right now, the current situation is like that. Thank you, Darko, for um, sharing your experience so honestly. And I think a lot of people will relate to that. And I think we also all know as people working in music that now is a time when we need music more than ever, right? And uh, yes. um, yeah, I don't know that we all have the answers. Um, Zhao Yue, um, you've um, changed the focus of Pelican quite a bit in the short time you've been operating in response to COVID restrictions. Um, can you say a little bit more about, about that? Sure, sure. Um, uh, so we, we only started the Pelican Music Academy at the end of 2019. And uh, we had elaborate plans for 2020, like multiple workshops, tours, and so on. And then we came back from Spring Festival, which is like uh, mid late February and everything was locked down because it happened to us like earlier than everyone else. Um, uh, so it was like, it was a panicky time, but uh, everyone, I feel that uh, everyone in the industry moved really quickly. Uh, they, they moved everything online. This is true for uh, for us and we are lucky. We were lucky because we didn't have much invested in touring or offline events. Um, but uh, everyone else, uh, like uh, those who run live houses or like they do international tours or they just have a larger roster that, they've, uh, that depends more on uh, shows, obviously they were hit, but uh, like, I would say in late February, Chinese people started um, experimenting with live stream like right away, just like that. And uh, people would uh, stream either from their own bedrooms or uh, they would go to like a small studios if they are together, or they even try to do like split screens and try to work and perform together. And uh, a lot of those just happened right away. And uh, I think like eventually this became, this state, this state for the platforms, they started running live shows as a regular program and uh, stayed for uh, like companies like us as well. So um, right now uh, we, uh, well, we, we know some people, like we know some live house run, uh, like runners and owners and uh, uh, several live houses and clubs did close down, but uh, then uh, we had a quicker recovery, like back in June and July, uh, the live houses uh, are open again. And then like in the second half of the year, uh, even some like festivals took place, like not in Beijing, but in other cities. So uh, we've seen like a, a nice recovery. So uh, it was like 
better in that ways. But uh, as I said, I think moving things online, try to uh, become more like a media than a promoter or like an organizer. That's the shift we were forced to make. And uh, I don't, I, I think, well, we've learned a lot from it. It wasn't like all black for us. Thank you, um, Jaye. Uh, I'm not quite sure how many minutes we have left, but David, keen to hear what's been happening in Uganda um, since the pandemic struck and how you've managed to navigate that. Sure, I'll try and do it in bullet points. Um, so first of all, I'd say that like we were encouraged by partners and uh, by looking at the news to try and go into uh, online gigs, live streaming. But unfortunately, uh, I know our experience is different uh, with all due respect to other people around the world. Um, we don't see that as the future for a couple of reasons. And I think what the main one being in Uganda and East Africa as, as, as a whole, data is much more expensive relative to income. So it actually costs loads of money to stream a gig. Secondly, uh, maybe I'm a bit of an old man now, but it just doesn't do it for me. You know, watching a gig online is not the same as, you know, the, the, the organic experience, the social experience of being in a venue. But, you know, I do understand that the next generation um, isn't so troubled by that. I am. So it's not something I'm personally I'm going to be pushing for. So but what I'd like to swing around to and, you know, uh, Darko's testimony really moved me a lot. And I, I feel terrible trying to put a positive spin on things. But Darko, forgive me, I'm going to try and find something positive in the last year, <laughs> which is the following. I see everything as contributing to an evolution of music. And I see that the COVID has demonstrated the fragility of the cultural sector. Yeah. Um, and we can't rely on donors, you know, as much as I'm grateful for support we've had in the past. We, right from the beginning, East African Records tried to be self-sufficient. So we do corporate gigs. We, we make messages for NGOs. We, we're desperately begging for, you know, to sell out at any opportunity. Now, I'm joking about that. We don't want to sell out, but I am looking for opportunities in the business sector. Always, you know, we're always looking to the private sector as a source of income. And COVID has demonstrated this like a big punch in the face. You know, don't rely on handouts. Don't rely on donors. You know, they unfortunately, they are also relying on bigger economic structures to work. And when those collapse, they're going to have to go, as Darko experienced. So what we did, the, the, the instructions or, uh, that we received from our partners, we passed on to the artists, which is try and go online as much as possible. Sure, some artists can get away with that. Some demographics can get away with that. We can't. So we ignored that one. And what we did was we went for small gigs, secret gigs, less than 30 people gigs in our garden. And, you know, invitation only, very uh, limited, obviously, but that's the direction that I see maybe even the whole world taking. Glastonbury isn't going to happen this year, you know, so what's the alternative? Lots of little gigs. And I think this kind of micro culture, hopefully, is the next stage of music evolution. And yeah, we want to be part of that and we look at it positively. So that's my conclusion. Evolution. Thanks. Thanks for that. I like the word microculture. I'm going to write it down. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Thanks, man. Let's all write it down. Um, thank you for putting such a, um, an uplifting spin on um, our final words. I do have a f one more question, if we're allowed. I think we're allowed to go over by a few minutes. Um, and that's, and this is for anyone to answer really, about international collaboration, whether that's between artists or between organizations. Um, when does international collaboration add something positive to a scene? And when might it distract if you like, from local issues at hand. Um, what are the positives and negatives of that outside influence? Maybe this is a really big question <laughs> and maybe it's not something you can ask, answer in a nutshell, but um, you know, or, or is this very blurred in today's hyper-connected hyper world, you know, um, thinking about people who might be interested in working with you in the future, thinking about the people you've worked with in the past, um, 
yeah, tell us about what you would like to see from international collaborators. Um, I don't mind leading on this because it's something Enough. we do a lot of, but I'll just try and keep it as snappy as, as possible. Um, so we were blessed with a number of uh, visiting residents uh, to our studios. So we've had, in the last couple of years, we've had a number of big names, if you like, from the production community, including uh, uh, Paul McCartney's producer, uh, who also produced the last Pink Floyd album who's called Martin Glover, also known as Youth. And we've had DJ Vadim, who's well known to the hip hop community. We've had Mungo's Hi-Fi, well known in the reggae community and so on. And I, I'm missing out some big other names here. The point um, that, that where it became most productive was where we worked together with the producers on specific projects with specific outcomes. And um, what the main advantage of a collaboration is like, introducing new elements to the visitors' music from our side and them introducing us to their network, to their promotional branding, etc. But, you know, look, let me be honest. I, the most I got out of it was simply the joy of creation and the joy of bringing together two very different kind of scenes or creative headspaces and putting them in the same space. And whether the music does well or not, I'm afraid that's secondary, uh, but we hope it does. But yeah, we just love making music. And I think that's the most satisfying thing for me is bringing different cultures together, different scenes together. Thank you, David. Does anyone else have another perspective on that? Uh, maybe I, well, I really can't see something negative about international collaboration. I think it's a, it's a great thing. I like the, the, the expression joy of creation, I think. Uh, um, well, I, I think we should ask the artists, by the way. Uh, and I think uh, they are the most important beneficiaries of uh, these exchanges. So uh, I'm thinking about, of course, the creative residencies and, uh, and we love to do that. And we are more than open to work, uh, to, to put together artists from different backgrounds, actually, from Morocco and abroad. Um, there is a festival, for example, in Sawira, which is called uh, Gnawa Festival, who did that very well and who who helped also this kind of music, which is Gnawa music, like step up and and open itself to new audiences uh, all over the world by mixing with rock music and uh, jazz music and so on. So I think it's very important also to give uh, sometimes more visibility to maybe a very local uh, music and uh, to make the artists uh, show it and, uh, and, uh, and make it accessible uh, by fusion to, uh, to, to another audience. So I, I, can't, I can't see something negative about this. And um, for example, in our uh, Hey Barak program, our um, music support program, what we basically do is that we, for each session, so we have four sessions a year uh, in uh, world music, rap, pop and, uh, uh, and the rock and metal music. And uh, each time we actually um, bring a music producer to work with the artist because we they, sometimes they create their music by themselves, but maybe they miss this little thing that can make their music go in the, in the market, let's say it this way. So, um, we had, for example, the opportunity to uh, invite uh, producers, especially for rock music. We invited uh, Chris Coulter. I don't know if you know him. Uh, he's a British uh, music producer. We worked also with a Spanish one. Uh, we had the, the opportunity to, to work with producers from really many countries. And it was great because the uh, either the artist discovered different ways of working, different uh, approaches of uh, music creation, but also music production. But the, what I must say is also that m my team in the recording studio, for example, like the sound engineers also, they experience different ways of working. So I think um, working with professionals from abroad because they have this experience, because they worked with great artists, uh, with international artists and so on, they, it brings it. It contributes in a way also to um, uh, to 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 make them work better and to improve 
uh, their uh, creation or production and uh, and skills uh, gen more generally. Thank you. We're being encouraged to wrap up this conversation now, but Jaya or Darko, is there anything, are there any other points you'd like to make just on this subject? Yeah, I can add a little bit. Um, on the international uh, collaboration, uh, collaboration part, uh, we've done uh, several projects like that. We've worked with a uh, British Council last year uh, on a like cloud residency project called Distant Dialogues. That has been like, uh, I agree with um, what everyone just said. It, it's obviously a great opportunity for the musicians to learn from each other. Uh, and uh, for, for us too, as, um, as people running the project, it was a great opportunity to learn how uh, things are done in other countries. And this is, I think this is very important. And uh, for, um, for this year, 2021, uh, on one hand, we're going to continue uh, the media side of projects we've done, like the live streaming series, the podcast. Uh, but uh, we are actively talking to the major Chinese platforms and also even real estates about funding and support. So what we hope to like mm, to to do is like later, maybe late in the second half of the year to actually do a comprehensive offline residency sort of project. Uh, what I really like is to emulate what uh, Red Bull Music Academy has done. So invite a ton of like mu musicians from different countries together so they could uh, teach each other and uh, collaborate, record and perform together. Uh, so that's my big dream for this year. Um, but that said, I also have like a fun fact I would share. It's a fun observation. So for last year, because we recovered a little bit faster than everyone, uh, so for the second part of the year, live, uh, live performance market uh, is actually like rather active. Um, and uh, that plus the fact that normally like China has, has seen a lot of like overseas bands performing as well, but this wasn't done last year. So this actually gave a lot of the local musicians like an extra, extra push. So uh, I mean, like I know, I think uh, competition is always a good thing and this is not going to happen like every year. But I think like, well done guys, like if you're able to take this as an, like opportunity to boost yourself, like well done. <laughs> Thank you, Dario. And I'm gonna give the last word briefly to, to Darko about international collaboration and yep. uh, how, you, how you feel about that. Um, first of all, production wise, um, it, would, it would be great, you know, if, if like uh, one of the like, um, what do you call it? Professional producer from developed countries could collaborate with, uh, um, you know, like a uh, talent from Myanmar uh, that can prove, you know, um, Myanmar also has great talent. You know, we just need some technical support. You know, we can prove that we can also make great music or good music, you know. That's one thing that we can prove it to the world. And other things, uh, second of all, it was uh, exposure. You know, if if now, if this allow us to be more connected, hopefully, and then, you know, like there must be a room for people like us from Myanmar to have an opportunity to, to have that exposure. For example, like if there was like a digital festival or concerts, in the West, you know, we could participate more, right? Right now, it, it allow us more to participate to get more exposure because we can make video here and just send it and they can just like show it to the world. That's again. And and the other, like the third one is like, the, just like just real artistic collaboration to make music together. And that is, that would be very encouraging for local talents now because, you know, like from uh, like, uh, more, to be more liberal or more more open, you know, since we are the conservative and uh, you know conservative society, which kind of like a kind of little bit left behind. Uh, so you know, which mean like most of these uh, progressive artists are fighting for their what do you call it their role or you know to have a spotlight because conservatism like are, is suppressing like suppressing them, you know, to thrive. So if, 
if someone successful from a developed country and more uh, liberal society can uh, collaborate with like somebody that they really like from our society, it could be great, uh, greatly encouraging. So thank that's you. Point. Thank you. Well, um, I think we have to call this uh, to a close. Thank you so much, Darko, Zainab, David, and Jaoyu. Um, we're going to look to share. I mean, I would encourage everyone to check out websites and social media by all these organizations. And we'll be looking to share whatever playlists we can get our hands on um, with uh, audiences so that you can really have a good listen to the, the wealth of talent that is out there from all these countries and cultures. So um, thank you very much and uh, look forward to remaining connected with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks right. all. Lovely meeting everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.